Good Monday morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ninja Chickens podcast. This is my crafty podcast. My name is Maria, and you can find me on Instagram as ninja.chickens and on Ravelry as Ninja Chickens. And you can find show notes and information on the ninjachickens.org website. Welcome to all of you. I'm really glad you're here to join me today. I have lots of fun stuff to talk to you about. And um, I hope you've had a really nice last couple of weeks. I'm inside today. I know I usually try and go outside for you, but it has been rainy, 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 rainy. It's actually the first sunny morning in many days, I think. All of the rain that you guys are missing over in Ireland and Sweden and Denmark is dumping on us. <laughs> Everything is moldy. The inside of the house is moldy. It's really crazy. So I keep trying to blow the clouds that way. So hopefully you're getting a little bit. But yeah, it, I know I podcasted a few months back about how much rain we've had and um, that it was like three times as much as it usually is in the spring. And it's just continued through the summer. So this area used to be um, used to be a rainforest and over the you know the last couple of decades things have gotten more dry but it seems like it's going back towards a really rainy area so I think we're still having just enough Sun that everything's okay for the farmers and the food but um, those rivers are getting high let me tell you <laughs> so I'm inside hoping to get a little podcast recorded for you guys we've got some one finished object a couple of works in progress and Isabella and I have lots of information to talk to you about mordanting. A lot of people have asked me when I've talked about natural dyeing about mordants and modifiers and what they mean and how to use them and all of that. So I'm going to try and cover some of that today. So I'm not a chemist. I'm not an expert, but I do want to go into what I've discovered in using mordants and natural dyeing and some of the research that I've done. So let's start with finished objects. First thing I want to show you is a new pattern I just finished. These are what I'm going to be calling my Sirius socks. S-I-R-I-U-S. -I like Sirius Black. Also like the Sirius Star. Leaf and I have been reading, uh, we just finished The Prisoner of Azkaban and he was asking about Sirius and I said, you know, that's actually the name of a star. So we started talking about the star and looked up um, the history of Sirius, and I had wanted to name this Star Sock or something like that, but more creative because Star Sock is kind of boring. And I thought, hey, maybe we should call it Sirius, Sirius Sock. So that's what it's going to be. Um, and I really like learning about the history um, Sirius because it's the brightest star in our sky, has been a part of many different cultures. Um, I think the first recorded information about it is from the Egyptians who um, it worshipped it as a goddess, Sobtep, I believe, Sopdet, S-O-P-D-E-T was the name of the goddess and that was what they called the star. And I also found some information that said that it be became the star of Isis also. Um, and it was worshipped uh, in Greek history, and I know the Native American tribe has a story of how the star Sirius and another star are part of two constellations that guide you, protect and guide you to the path of souls. So it was a really cool, um, really so cool little research project. So these will be the Sirius socks. They're in testing right now. They've already gone uh, through my tech editor and everything looks good. And I'm hoping to publish them on the first day of fall on September 20, 23rd. I knit these out of a new sock base from Dynamics Yarn, that's um, Mars of Haybron Berry and her daughter Adachi run the yarn company and it's a 100% Coriadale and it's super soft but seems super sturdy so I'm excited to try these out and see how they wear. I know she's going to have a few kits for sale when the, when the pattern comes out but you know any good sturdy sock weight yarn would be great. If you're doing color work, I would recommend something with a little bit of grip to it, a little bit of tooth to it. A 100% a merino superwash is probably going to be a little too slippery. So you'll want something that's a little a little more rustic. I, I, I guess that's the word you could use. They're not rustic socks, though. This is super soft, but it has some grip to it. So anyway, I hope you guys like it. I'm excited to put that out. 
I also just published this pattern. I told you about it last time, but this, it came out last week. It's called Rubia. Uh, Rubia is the part of the scientific name of matter, and I used matter to dye some of these sock blanks. So I just like the name. It's a nice cowl, nice cozy, squishy cowl. So that's on Ravelry now. And then I cast it on two things so that I can take them to my trip up into Maine. The first thing is, um, so I really wanted to knit this sweater. And it was a sweater by Isabel Kramer that I really just liked the look of. And I spent, I feel like, hours trying to find the right yarn to go with this it needed to be the right weight, the right color. I was thinking about striping it and I just couldn't find what I wanted. And so I thought maybe instead of buying a lot of new yarn because I have so much yarn, I just don't have any sweater quantities, I should see what I've got in, st in stash. So I picked out a different pattern and this is called the Lightweight Rag and Pullover by Pearl Soho. It's a similar look to the one I saw uh, from Isabel Kramer, just kind of a a simple, classy, cozy pullover. But it's in fingering weight yarn, so I went through and picked out a bunch of fingering weight yarn that I think is gorgeous, but it's been sitting in my stash and I haven't used it and decided I'm gonna put it together in a sweater. I guess it's gonna be kind of like a fade because I'm gonna try to mix the colors as I go up. The first color is by Ellie and Ada and it has lots of beautiful browns. and some copper and yellow and even a little bit of purplish in there. This one was gifted to me by Kate of Hawthorne Cottage Craft this past year and I really love it, but I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't just want it to be socks. So I decided this is gonna be the bottom of it. You work from the bottom up. And then next I'm gonna to go to, I think this one, which is a rock and string creation yarn which has a little bit of that yellow in it, that, that copper. And then I'll move to this one, which is a spun right round yarn. And I was hoping to just use these three, but I don't think it's gonna be enough. So I need your opinion. I can either, Kaya says, my daughter says she thinks I should um, stripe, the, you know, fade up the body as well as fading up the sleeves. The other option is to use those three main colors as the body and then do a separate color on the sleeves. And then when you attach the sleeves, continue in one solid color. So this is the third color I'm thinking, or the fourth color I'm thinking of, which would go nicely with this. Let's see if I can get it in the light a little better. And there's a bunch of it, so I could definitely do it for arms. I'm just not sure if I want the look of something that has a completely separate color arm and then stops at the shoulder, or if I just want to fade it all the way up. So let me know in the comments what you think, because I'm not, I haven't, uh, the only thing I've done so far is cast on the body, like just cast on the body. I haven't even attached it in the round yet. I just wanted to get things started so I could try and have a few things to go for my trip. So I think that's gonna be beautiful though. It looks like it's gonna be super cozy, like a nice, a nice fall throw, throw on sweater. The other thing I cast it on is a brand new pattern by Raquel Francia and it's called Sol de Verano. And I don't have a good picture of it. Well, here is the little tank picture. It's a really cute summer tank and it's in cotton. Other than like kitchen rags. I don't think I've ever knit anything in just cotton. So I thought that would be fun to try. And when I saw it, I thought that's the cutest little tank. So I just casted that one onto. And I got some cotton from Sestari. Sestari Wool is a sheep and wool um, and cotton company in Virginia. And they actually harvest Virginia cotton. And this is 100% Virginia cotton. And it's hard to see in the light, but this skein is a lot redder than this skein. This one's more pink. So at first I was thinking, oh great, I'm gonna have to stripe them all the way up. But then I remembered this pattern is done in a front piece and a back piece. 
So I'm just going to use the pinker one for the back and the redder one for the front, and you probably won't tell the difference. <laughs> I mean, you might be able to, but it'll probably still look okay, and then I don't have to stripe them. But it's nice. It's After using wool for so many years, it's hard to go to cotton, which just has no give at all. But, um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to try this. This is her first pattern, and it's super cute. And I really like the stitching so far. Can see that sorry it's a little floppy so I'll be working on those while I'm traveling and um, yeah I forgot to mention when I was talking about the give of the cotton it reminded me of this if you're doing uh, color work especially color work socks if you haven't done them before you may have run into this before you have to be super careful with your tension because this does not have anywhere near as much give as this area does so this is going to be a lot harder to pull over your heel if you don't have enough give. So you have to be real careful on the inside to make sure that you have left enough, um, an, enough yarn in your floats to give them a little stretch. Another thing you can do is use a yarn that has stretch to it. If you use the yarn like cotton, it, it would just wouldn't have any give at all when you're trying to pull that color work section over your heel. But if you use a yarn that has lots of give, that's got a lot of crimp in it and, you know, nice and stretchy, you have to knit it with enough relaxation in your tension that you're not pulling it tight. So, well, I don't, if, you, if you take the yarn and you've got it wrapped tightly around your fingers and you're pulling it really tight and your tension is super tight, when you are knitting your color work, all that give is going to squeeze it snug, squeeze it tighter when you're done. So if you knit it somewhat loosely, then it sits naturally and has more stretch after you're done. Does that make sense? So you need to find a yarn that has either a little bit of bounce to it, so that will help with the color work, or if it doesn't have much give, you have to really watch your tension. Because that's the hardest thing about color work socks is you'll knit them all and then they don't go over your heels. These are snug, but they will go over my heels, but I had to go back and relax a couple of these rows, especially because these rows right here with the orange, you're carrying three colors together instead of two. There's only a few rows like that in the pattern, but, but that's gonna make it even tighter. So just a word about color work socks. <laughs> okay, so last time I chatted with you, I told you that I was probably gonna do some experimenting with the local variety of polygonum that I have in my yard. So I gathered a bunch of it. I put it in this in my Instagram stories and if you go now to the little tab that says natural dyeing, you'll see some some of what I did. I cut the leaves and put them in an ice bath and then blended them up and used that bath to dip some yarn and silks in. So Real quickly, because I've got it in the stories, the, the process is that you take the leaves off the indigo, you leave, so there's some knots on the indigo stem, you leave two or three knots at least, and then clip above it. From there, more will grow, and that way you're not taking the whole plant down. So if you're wanting to harvest your indigo, you have to make sure you at least have four or five knots so you can trim off something above those two to three knots and keep letting it grow from below. You strip the leaves off, you put them in ice cold water. That will help keep them from oxidizing and letting out all of their blue color, binding up all the blue color with oxygen. And when you have enough, you take it in the ice water and you put it in a blender and you make a sludge and you let it sit for 30 minutes. Then you strain it out, you take that old sludge, you put it in more ice water and you blend it again and let it sit for another 30 minutes. Then you mix it all together and you can put your yarn you should have this deep emerald green fluid. It's a beautiful, beautiful color. What I got was, it was green. It was not a deep emerald green. So I used some yarn that was unmordanted because you don't have to mordant with indigo. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I used some silks that were mordanted. And when they first came out, they were a beautiful lime green. They didn't turn blue, but they had a gorgeous green color that I've not seen much in natural dyes. 
But after sitting a little while and giving them a good rinse, they have turned pretty pale. There is still the slightest hint of green in there. Let me put it up against some white so you can see. So you see just a tiny bit, but really very little. I was excited, hoping I might get a little color, but I wasn't optimistic because I figured I can't be the first person to think, hey, this looks a lot like indigo. It's a cousin. Let's try it. And maybe if I fermented it, maybe if I did it a different way, I would get a little bit of color because supposedly it does have some of that indigo chemical in it, but just a much smaller amount compared to the Japanese indigo. So I'll end up dyeing these again. This one was probably the darkest. And still there's, I mean, it just, on the camera, it looks cream. There's a little bit of green to it, but it definitely faded out. So it's since been mowed over. <laughs> I was thinking about saving it and doing um, another type of trial with it, but um, my the family who lives on our land does some mowing around the yard and they mowed over all of it last night. I was like, okay, well, it wasn't meant to be. No more trials of that one. So that's what happened. It did not work out well, but it was fun to try. Um, let's see. what. It, oh, I did want to tell you the this that I'm going to be doing. I'm casting on for the Not Everybody Goes to Rhinebeck Knit Along. And in case you haven't heard about it yet or you're new to the podcast, for those people who, or if you've never heard of Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck is a pretty, pretty big, pretty well-known sheep and wool festival, fiber festival in October. It's in Rhinebeck, New York, and not everybody can go. And lots of people love going, and there's always a, knit, a sweater knit along, and everybody shows off their Rhinebeck sweater, and there's apple cider donuts, and there's, um, there's sheep dog demonstrations and all kinds of fun stuff. But since there's a lot of people who can't go, we decided to do a not everybody goes to Rhinebeck virtual festival that weekend so that you can join in on um, getting stuff from your favorite makers. You can do a knit, you know, knit along and make a sweater. Uh, and I am going to be releasing a, a tea recipe for apple cider donut tea. I will probably do that after I come back from my trip and that way you'll still have enough time to gather your things if you want to make tea. But for the knit along, I am donating a couple of things for the winners. I can't really participate because I'm part of it, but I'm going to knit a sweater anyway. But I've made some of the apple cider tea, apple cider donut tea. You can see it a little bit in there. So I will donate some sample, a sample of that as well as a sock blank. So what will happen is, and this is a sock blank I pulled out. This one was dyed with Queen Anne's lace and matter and then print, printed with a bunch of different plants. And I thought it was really pretty. So all of the information about the knit along, the sweater knit along is at Tiny Human Knits Ravelry Group. She is hosting it as the main place where you can go and see who's knit what and hear about prizes and stuff like that. So Tiny Human Knits if you go there. But what I'll do after is if you tag your finished sweater with not Rhinebeck sweater F-O. I'll put that below. That's what I'll go through and pick who, um, who the winner will be of that. I know that Natalie of Remembrance's Pottery is going to be donating a mug and there's a lot of other people who are, who are doing prizes for that to get everybody interested in knitting along and doing their own sweater for not going to Rhinebeck. <laughs> So that's going through, I think it's through November 1st, so there's still lots of time to cast on and get something going. Okay, so I think it's time to talk about mordants. So I did ask on Instagram to take some of your questions about mordants, and I will go over all of those. But I wanted to just basically go over what a mordant means, um, what it is, all of that stuff. So take indigo, put it to the side. That does not apply to this. All other natural dyes, um, we can talk about these mordants. <laughs> you can mordant things with indigo, but I'll tell you why it's different in a little bit. So a mordant is something that helps to 
connect your dye with your material. Whether it is a protein fiber from an animal or a, a plant fiber. Protein fibers generally take dyes better than plant fibers like cotton or linen or something like that. So it's easier to dye on those materials. Okay, so a mordant is something that will chemically bond between, will chemically bond to your fiber, whatever kind of fiber it is. It's a molecular bond and that's why it makes it so strong. strong. Most, many mordants are salts and many mordants are acids and they have uh, a hydrogen atom that is ready to grab and bond. So it's like, say your natural dye is the fuzzy side of the Velcro and your fiber has a fuzzy side to the Velcro. When they try to attach, they don't attach very well. They kind of slide off. Say the mordant has the two hook sides. It can attach to your fiber, it can attach to your dye, it can hold them in place. <laughs> That's my um, Mordant Dig for Dummies 101. <laughs> it basically holds hands with them, right? It bonds to the first one. So you're, it's like you're dyeing your fiber with your mordant first, and then it reaches out and grabs onto the dye and holds on. It's a chemical bond. Um, so let me go over some of the different kinds of mordants. Some people use mordant in a very loose term. And so it makes it really confusing because there's so many different things you can find on the internet about what's a mordant and what's not and why is it a mordant. With your protein fibers, the most common mordant is aluminum sulfate or alum. It's often used with cream of tartar because it can help with the uptake of dye. It makes things a little bit deeper in shade. Aluminum sulfate is mined out of the ground. It, is, it has been used in, in the food industry in the past. Uh, it's not so much anymore. It's considered the least toxic of the mordants, of the chemical mordants. And the reason why people would use the word toxicity with any of these mordants is because they're metals. So um, aluminum, when it bonds to the fiber, it's more that it's toxic to the dye, or when it bonds to the fiber, it's bonded. It should not be rubbing off on your skin and getting into your skin. But you're using it as a powder form first and pouring it into the water. If it gets in the air and gets into your lungs, it is not good for your lungs. There's also been some research that aluminum could be contributing to uh, the rise in Alzheimer's disease. So breathing it in is not a good thing. Sticking your hands in an aluminum bath is not a good thing because your hands, I mean, these are very absorbable things. <laughs> so for the dyer, using a mask, using gloves, it's really important. But once it is dyed and bonded and rinsed, it should be fine. Um, the other alum you would have heard about is aluminum acetate. And that is, as opposed to sulfate, you've got acetate. The aluminum acetate is what's used really often with plant fibers. The sulfate doesn't work so well, but the aluminum acetate does. This one's even more of a powdery substance, so you really have to be careful with it. If they're also, most, most of the mordant, metal mordants, you put them in the water, you put your fiber in the water, you warm it up and then you get just the slightest bit of, oh, is it sulfuric acid? Well, not with all of them, it'd be a different one, let's see. I wrote this down. Um, well, acidic fumes, basically. And so it's really good to do your, your, if you're gonna heat it up, do it outside. When Nikki and I first started Fern Fiber, we were mordanting inside and both of us were getting headaches and we realized that it was, it was you know, immediately associated with mordanting inside. We started doing it outside, and since then, I've actually started doing a cold method of mordanting, and I think this was one of the questions, where I put the alum, aluminum sulfate, in the water, I stirred around to dissolve it, I put my yarn in and I let it sit for 24 hours overnight, and I don't heat it, and it works perfectly. 
It's not something you read a lot about. I'd heard about it from another dyer and it works really well. I've never had a problem with it. I've been doing that for two or three years. So that is an option too. And then you don't heat it and you don't get that acid fume. Okay, so um, that's alum. And we'll go over the process of when you can mordant it, all that stuff in a second. The next thing that's really common is iron and that's ferrous sulfate. Turn my notes. I wrote a lot of notes for you guys. So, um, Ferrous sulfate is used to what's called sadden a yarn color. It will turn the yellows to greens. It will turn, turn the pinks to purples. It deepens it and makes it a, a more muted color. A dark, it's usually a little bit of a darker, sadder color. But it is itself a mordant. So you can use it instead of alum. You can just use that to attach, to help attach and strengthen the, the bond between your dye and your fiber. The thing about iron is, again, when you heat it, it can put off some um, acidic fumes. It can be pretty harsh on your material. It can make things brittle. If you use too much, you don't, you don't need much at all. And again, it can be absorbed. So you don't want to touch it. You don't want to breathe it in. But once it's bonded, it's attached, and it's not going to rub off on your skin. The next one, and I found this one really interesting, is tin or stannous chloride. All I'd ever read or heard about tin was, that's probably the most toxic um, mordanting material and you probably shouldn't use it. But um, I never found out why. Like, I'd never really looked into it. It's, oh, well, that's toxic, so I'm not gonna use it. Tin is also a, um, a mild acid, stannous chloride, I think I already said that. It can also be a little harsh on the fiber um, it, all the same things with alum and iron. It can put off a little bit of a fume. But one thing that I found out was really interesting, and I want to read this to you, because I couldn't find, actually, I found many references as to the non-toxicity of tin, like scientific research things. So let me say, let me read this to you. Inorganic tin salts are considered to have low toxicity since they are most enti almost entirely excreted after being ingested, if you were to eat it. The World Health Organization has determined that it's not necessary to determine a numerical value for allowable tin content in drinking water, which is mirrored by the EPA. So they feel like it gets out of your system so easily, it's, they don't have a number value to what's too much, which I thought was interesting. A pervasive myth in the natural dye world is that tin is highly toxic. It's actually no more or less toxic than alum and significantly less toxic than iron. I don't know where the reputation originated. Perhaps this misinformed, the misinformed confused inorganic stannous chloride, which is what you use for natural dyeing, with organotin compounds, which are completely different and highly carcinogenic. So um, something I want to do a little bit more research into because it might actually be less toxic than using copper or iron. So I'm, if you guys know any research about that, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. So the next one is copper. Copper is often used to blue in things. <laughs> is that a word? <laughs> to make things more blue. Uh, yeah, it, it, will, it will bring out the blue properties and somewhat sadden things, but makes them more blue-green usually. Um, copper does not harshen, harshen, I'm, using, I'm making up my own words <laughs> today. It does not make thing, make the, it's not harsh on the fibers like tin and iron, which is nice. Uh, and it actually is a little more color fast than alum. And what I mean by color fast is that it holds the color, that it's not going to either bleed or fade with light or washing. And you'll hear that word a lot, the color fastness of a dye. But the same with alum and with iron, you don't wanna stick your hands in it, you don't wanna breathe it in, so wear your gloves, wear your masks. Once it's dyed, it's secure and it shouldn't rub, it's not rubbing off on your skin. All of these things are taken from the earth, right? So putting them back into the earth is not a huge deal if it's in very, very small quantities, you don't want to go and dump a bunch of alum and copper into a waterway because that's going to hurt the 
that's going to hurt the, the fish life, the plant life. But if you use your dye pot and you, or your mordant pot, and you continue to use it until it's you know, cloudy, you're not, maybe three, four times you're mordanting your things in the same pot, you're exhausting that pot. You could actually use this leftover water on acid loving plants. And you're not putting much back into the earth because you've exhausted all of those metal mordants out of the bath. If you can exhaust your mordant bath, then that's the best thing to do. So the last mordant you may hear about, which I don't know anyone using anymore, and I don't even know that they sell it anymore, is chrome. And chrome is, what's the scientific name? Potassium dichromate. It works the same way in bonding with hydrogen bonds. It is very toxic. It is not one that you want in, on your body, in your waterway. It's just not one people are using anymore. It can cause contact dermatitis, and it's also a known carcinogen. So it can cause cancer. So chrome is not used in natural dyeing anymore. It was used many years ago before we knew the side effects to create you know, vibrant colors, but that's not one that's used. So some other mordants that you will hear about. Um, you might hear people saying apple cider vinegar or vinegar or baking soda. Those are things that I would call modifiers. They help to change the color because they change the pH, but they don't, they don't chemically bond the same way these metal salts do or as strongly. So if you're using just apple cider vinegar and natural dyeing, it will fade after a while. A lot of times vinegar and stuff like that is used with acid dyeing, with, with chemical dyes. It's a totally different thing. And that might help it bond or take up all the color. But with natural dyes, it's not the same thing. Yeah, so iron. <laughs> iron is a mordant. It can also modify your color. So if I were to dye, um, I'll show you this. Okay, so this is a card that I made when I was at a class a few years ago on the 20 colors of matter. Every single one of these was dyed with matter root. The difference is the mordant and the modifier. So for example, this was dyed with no mordant, no modifier. It was just alum, or sorry, excuse me, just matter root, okay? Then we added an acid modifier, okay? So it was dyed and then some acid was added and I think we just used vinegar that changed the color. Obviously, Matter is not a plant that needs a mordant, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Then we use an alkali modifier. So it was dyed, and then we put it in and raised the pH, and we got a different color. Then we used iron to modify the color. So that mordanted it at the same time. And then we used copper to modify the color. So again, these two are also mordanted and modified. So the same thing goes on. These five right here were all mordanted first with alum and then changed, right? So this was then put into an acid bath or an alkaline bath or an iron bath or a copper bath. These next five were mordanted first with iron, then they were changed. So first it was dyed, and these were copper. So all of these colors were first either mordanted or not. <laughs> then that yarn was taken and dipped into different baths of acid, an acid bath, and it's not like an acid bath, it's a slightly lower pH bath, maybe five, um, or a higher pH bath, or a bath with iron, or a bath with copper, right? So we ended up with five different samples all from that one original color. That's how you get so many different colors from a plant. You mordant, you modify, you adjust the pH, okay? So, um, so a mordant can be a modifier, but not all modifiers are mordants. Like you can use vinegar or washing soda or baking soda. Those aren't really mordants, but they will modify your color. They will change it slightly because of the pH. Now, 
um, let me tell you a little bit about, we're going to here there, some other things that aren't necessarily metals. You can also use things like tannins. Tannins are a, a compound that's found in plants, many plants like black walnut, like oaks, oak galls and oak leaves, in maple. So, you know, in the fall when the leaves fall off and the leaves hit the the sidewalk and they sit there for a little while and then they blow away you know maybe it's been rainy and you see the leaf imprint like this outline of a black leaf on the sidewalk have you guys ever seen that that's the tannins that's the tannin having a chemical reaction with the concrete and the rain and creating an outline tannins do the same thing that the the metal salts do they help bond between the, the fiber and the dye. They're especially helpful when dyeing with plant material. Often people will use aluminum acetate and tannins to create a really strong bond with your with your cotton or linen. I mean, yeah, cotton or linen or other plant materials. They also work on uh, <laughs> like people fiber, no, wool, animal fiber. <laughs> they also work on animal fiber. The thing about tannins is most of them will change the color slightly. It will make it just the slightest more creamy or a little bit more brown, depending on the tannin that you use. And, um, and that's a, a nice way to do natural dyeing without using the metal salts if you're not wanting to use those. There's, a, there's also a plant that's, that's been in the news a lot more recently called Simplicos, which is a tropical plant. And I believe it's the bark that is used. I'm not positive. You guys can correct me on that if, if you know. But it's, a very, it's very, very high in tannins. It, or excuse me, in aluminum. It pulls the aluminum out of the earth, and the plant is extremely high in aluminum. So you, it's, it's being used instead of aluminum sulfate or aluminum acetate. I think it works for both plant and, um, I keep wanting to say people fiber, <laughs> plant and animal fiber. So that's a nice one to know about. A lot of people will use soy. And um, you, can use, you can use regular soy milk and dilute it, or you can buy, get soybeans and soak them yourself. Soy is a protein. It bonds really well to plant fiber and protein fiber, but some people will use it, use the soy and then some tannins. There's many different ways to combine them. That's one thing that you're going to learn about natural dyeing is some people just use alum. That's what they do. It works well. Some people just use soy. Some people experiment with all of them. It depends on the colors that you want. It depends on, you know, where you live. If I lived in a tropical area, I would probably be using Simplicos and, and you know, other things that I found right there because I have oak and black walnut and all of that here, I can use these tannins much more easily. Um, and the soy, you know, the soy is fabulous. It's, it's a, a renewable resource, but then you just want to make sure that you're getting your soy from a place that's not like genetically modified or grown with tons of pesticides because then you're contributing to that cycle. So there's a lot of thinking into, you know, well, do I get it out of an alum mine or do I get it from a soy field or, you know, you have to figure out what's right for you. But those are some of the ones that work, work well and fairly consistently. The metal salts and the tannins for animal fiber, the alum acetate and soy and tannins for plant fiber. Those are the best. Historically, and still, depending on where you live, urine has been used as a mordant, specifically to get really dark, colors, even blacks, out of dyes. I have not tried that yet. I'm a little worried about how you'll um, respond if I start using urine as a mordant <laughs> with my sunk blanks. So I probably won't do that. You're welcome. However, um, there's actually a scene for those of you who are Outlander fans when Claire is traveling. She's first traveling with the... Um, with the Scottish crew and she's in a village. She doesn't want to be there and she's drinking with some of the ladies in the village and they're, they're taking this fiber and doing this on the table and she has to go pee in a bucket. It's because they're using the urine for the, 
for the for the mordant. They're using the urine to set the color. Um, and that's why they keep drinking and peeing in a bucket and drinking and peeing some more because they're trying to set the color on this fiber. So I thought that was really cool. Let's see. I want to make sure I'm covering all of this. We've talked about the different types. We've talked about modifiers a little bit. So um, not all not all natural dyes need to be mordanted, mainly because they carry their own tannins or they carry their own chemical that bonds, makes a chemical bond with the fiber. So that's why, you know, matter has some of that. Matter will dye and stay color fast without a mordant. But to get that red that everybody likes out of matter, you need a mordant. Um, it's hard to see. Well, you can see it all right. Let's see if I can put white behind it. The variety of these colors at the bottom, it looks just dark. But what they are is this is kind of a, a dark gray. That's a dark brown. This is a dark, dark purple. This is more of like a maroon. Um, there are 20 different colors here, which is pretty cool. So some lichens, many lichens carry their own chemicals their own chemical mordants. So you don't have to mordant first. But if you do, you might come up with a different color because of how they bond with each other. That's all, it's all about the chemical bonds and, and what color comes out of that, right? So um, I'm trying to think of some of the others. I mean, any of the plants with tannins. If I wanted to dye something with maple leaves, if I wanted to dye something with uh, pomegranate or Oh, what are some of the others? Persimmons. They all carry their own tannins in them, so I don't have to mordant them unless I want to change the color from that. So let's talk about changing the color. Someone asked in the questions, when do you do a mordant? You can do it at any time. Most people mordant first, take it out of that mordanting bath, and then dye the plants with their dye material. You can also put the mordant and the dye in at the same time, or you can mordant afterwards. But what's happening is if your mordant is there and in place and it's bonded first, you're going to have a higher uptake of dye. Similar, you don't get too much of a change if you do it at the same time. But if you put it in the plant material first and then put it in the mordant after, a post mordant, it's going to be a different color because it's not going to have bonded as well. So most people will mordant first, dye, then modify. If you want to change the color at all with another mordant or with an acid or a base, then you do that. You can do that after. So that's the general schedule of things. But again, <laughs> there's many ways to do it. And you'll find that with, with all the different natural dyes out there. There's many different ways to do it. The the goal, though, is to make sure that the way you do it creates a, a, a color fast product. Now, let's talk about those that aren't color fast. Some things, no matter what you add to them, no matter what modifiers or mordants, just don't stay. Like this, right? This one wasn't mordanted and it was an indigo. <laughs> so it's not really the best example, but turmeric. Everybody says turmeric is not light fast right? It makes this gorgeous yellow or orange or green or whatever, depending on what more, what what you add to it, but it will fade over time in the light. It's just the way it is. It does not hold as tight as you, it, it doesn't bond as tightly as you want it to, to your fiber. Having said that, last year, about a year and a month ago, I dyed my bed sheets with turmeric, and you may remember that from the podcast. The lower bed sheet was a gorgeous golden yellow. I have been using it on my bed and washing it since then because I love the look of it and I love the way it feels sitting in naturally dyed and eco-printed sheets. It has faded very little. And that's just, I mean, you know, yes, it's, it's covered up. And, you know, we make our bed in the morning. It's covered. It's not getting a lot of sun. But even with all the washing, it's not faded that much. But if you are going to be selling products and you don't know if it's going to fade or you know it's something that's fading, you're not going to want someone to create a gorgeous sweater out of pokeberries 
and it's bright pink, and then after a few years of wear, it fades to a pale salmon-y color. So it's important to know which ones, which ones stay and which ones don't. Some of them make a strong chemical bond, and they just stay that way, and those are considered light fast and, fast and wash fast. And some of them just don't. They don't. They make a good bond at first, and then they kind of fade. Many berries, because um, they have anthocyanins in them, that's what gives them those blue and red colors, they just don't make strong bonds, and they will fade. There are a few that do make a nice strong bond, like um, chokeberry makes a nice strong strong bond. Many flowers also will fade quickly because they have that, that blue in it that doesn't stay. That's why blue's been so hard to get, historically. So talking about blue, gosh, I'm rambling on. I hope you guys are getting some good stuff out of this. Indigo. Indigo is not a chemical bond. It is a physical bond. That is why it's so different when you are dying with indigo than any other thing and you have to make, or woad, you have to make this, this vat or an ice bath, right? So what happens is, let's see if I can get my head around all of this. Okay, so indigo is, that blue color is not soluble in water. So you can't just take it and simmer it like you would any other dye and, and get that color. It has to be what's called reduced. It has to have that oxygen molecule, molecule removed so that it's ready to bond, it's ready to absorb in water. And what happens is, you put your fabric in, the indigo molecule, when it's been reduced, worms its way in between the fabrics. It doesn't chemically bond to it. It gets in between the mesh, right? And then when it's taken out and, the, uh, and it's re-oxidized, it gets stuck. So the indigo, the indigo molecule is stuck in the fibers. It's not bonded to them. It's like it's held in jail. That's the way I see it. That is why you have the problem with crocking. Some of you know that when you knit with indigo, where you, when you wear indigo, or when you wash it over and over, the blue comes out. It seems like it comes out. What happens is, if you have a strong indigo bath, and you, you dip your fiber in there, and you take it out, some of that is going to be bonded, physically bonded, in between the molecules. Some of it will be sitting on the top. And with a rinse or with working it, you will get that blue off on your fingers. But you still have some bonded inside. So that's why when you hear people talking about dyeing with indigo, they say, don't make the bath too strong. You don't want too much in there because if you dunk it in there, it just kind of piles on top of itself, on top of the fiber and not absorbing into it. So you'll, you'll dunk, if you want a dark blue, you dunk it five, ten times. You'll dunk it, let it oxygenize, dunk it again, let it oxygenize. You keep doing that to build up the color, and it wiggles its way in, and it kind of just sits next to its friend, and, and it gets inside the molecules, inside the molecular structure, right? And it gets in jail and gets held in place, as opposed to just piling up on top if you do it too quickly, in a bath that has too much indigo. Does that make sense? So to reduce the crocking, an indigo dyer will do many dips and rinse it well, and hopefully you shouldn't get too much on your fingers, but often you do anyway just because there's always a little sun left on the outside. So that's why indigo is different. And I say indigo, but indigo and weld in those plants that you use, you extract that blue chemical from. Because it's not a chemical bond, it's a physical bond, and you have to alter or deoxygenize the indigo before it's absorbable, it's dissolvable in water. Okay, woo! What else do we need to talk about? I feel like I've covered a lot of that. So let me go over some of the questions that you guys had, make sure I've answered everything. Um, let's see. Helen Ullman asked, is a mordant meant to make the color stronger? or make the color stick to the wool, or perhaps both. I would say both. So some plant material will show up as a stronger color because it is mordanted, but it is definitely a stronger bond because it's mordanted. So 
so yes, it sticks to the sticks to the wool better and can create a stronger color. Let's see. Um, KCUUSH asked, how do you mordant for plant and animal fibers in the same yarn? Do you do it all in one step or mordant for one first and then for another? This is actually one that I've done before with my Amigas top. This was the one that I knitted in all white from uh, Magpie Fibers Solstice yarn. And then it's also Magpie Fibers design. It's called Amigas. And it has wool, silk, and cotton. So the first thing I did is I wanted to make sure that the cotton would bond to my dye. And I made myself a homemade soy bath. That was my first time doing that. And soaked it in the soy, let it dry, soaked it again, let it dry. Because similar to the indigo, you want the soy to kind of build up on it. So you usually will either soak it for an extended period of time or do repeated dips and let it dry in between. So I dipped it three times, let it dry three times. Then I put it in a bath that included both aluminum sulfate and aluminum acetate. So I covered all my bases <laughs> and it bonded beautifully. Um, it's a little bit deeper of a red than it's looking like on here. That's looking a little too cherry red. But it's a gorgeous color. And it worked well. And it seems like it seems like it bonded well to all the fibers. So that's my only experience with doing something that has both plant and animal fiber. But yes, if you have something like that in your, if you have both fibers in your yarn or in your finished garment, then you want to mordant for both. And if you're using the metal salts, I think you can do them both in the same bath. But if you're going to be using soy and tannin or soy and aluminum, I would say separate the baths out and do it in stages. Um, let's see. Purdy.lane asked about mordanting cotton and cold mordanting. Cold mordanting. So I think I touched on both of those. The cold mordanting, which means not heating it up on the stove. Um, and I let mine sit for 24 hours, and that seems to work just fine. And then mordanting cotton, we talked about soy and tannins and aluminum acetate. Um, let's see. Deb Doodles 59, 591, no, 59, says, um, I would like to dye some hand spun yarn with fireweed flowers. What mordant would I use? And how long would I soak the yarn prior to dyeing? dyeing? So it's a wool yarn. Um, so you'd want to use one of the metal salts. If you're wanting to get the color as close to the fireweed flower as possible. I don't know how fireweed dyes or what color it puts out, but if you don't want to modify it too much, change the color too much, then I would use either alum or tannins. Tannins will make it slightly browner. The alum will probably make it more crisp, so aluminum sulfate, and maybe adding some cream of tartar to bring out that color. And I want to see what it looks like, so show us on Instagram or, or, um, or put it in the Ravelry group, because I'd love to see what it looks like. And how long would you let it soak? Um, I, you know, if you're doing a cold mordanting, let it sit in the mordant for 24 hours. If you're sitting, at, if you're doing the heated mordanting, then you can just gently, gently simmer it, like no wild bubbles or anything, because you don't want it to felt for an hour on the stove. And do it outside, so that you don't get the fumes in your house. Let's see, Undead Heidi, hey Heidi, says, I've heard that not all natural dyes required mordants. Is this true? Yes, it is true. Those are the ones that we talked about that have their own chemicals in them to mordant as they dye. And then, let's see, Vermilion Girl asks, um, I seem to have much better results with wool, cotton, and linen. As a re with wool, cotton and linen is a real mixed bag. Which tannin mordants work best with cotton? I don't have a huge amount of experience with cotton. Uh, I've used the soy, which is a protein dye, and um, and I've used oak galls, which seems to work well. I know people really like using Simplicos, um, persimmon, and pomegranate. Those seem to work well. I'm not sure if one works better than the other. I can't really answer that one. But um, I think any of the tannin mordants what have you tried? Put that in the comments if you don't mind. I'd like to know what you've tried so far, as if you've tried tannin mordants or if you've used something else. Maybe what you need to do is also add the aluminum acetate to it or 
a, two mordants. Maybe you need more than one um, to build it up. So some of the other questions that I had that weren't specifically mordant related, but I just wanted to answer for you if I could, is um, H2Onia asked me to talk about PFD versus RFD, and I had no idea what this was, fabrics. I had no idea what this was when she asked that, so I was like, I don't know, you'll have to tell me, but I looked it up. PFD is prepared for dyeing, fabric or yarn. PFD or PTD is ready to dye or ready for dyeing. Are they the same thing? Do you need to scour them and mordant them? What I could find is some people use them interchangeably, but basically these fabrics have been scoured, have been washed, and are ready to dye. You don't have to do anything to them. They've not been mordanted that I can tell. So I think that if you're using natural dyes, you would need to mordant them. And um, some of them may have a, a bleach whitener used to make them whiter that bleach whitener is going to take up some of the bonds where your dye would bond. So you would want to stay away from those um, because they're not going to dye as, as deeply as the other ones. But it sounds to me like, from my research, the PFD and the RFD or RTD are basically about the same thing. They may have had a different process, but they're basically ready for dyeing, except for the mordanting. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, do you ever dip your plant, this is It's Me Fiber asks, do you ever dip your plant material in an iron bath before applying it to fabric like sock blanks? Yes, I do. That is a little secret on how to get things like this. Giving away all my secrets. So that background right there is because I dipped the maple leaf in a very mild iron solution and then put it on here. So the iron is not affecting the whole color of the blanket. It's just affecting the, the edges of the maple leaf. And the same thing with the, with the rose leaf. So you see how it looks like it has an outline. That is from a dip in the iron bath. Smart cookie, it's me fiber. <laughs> so yes, I do that sometimes as a way to change, modify the color of the plant and it also more than that spot. Um, let's see. Wooly Bear Crafts asked, let's see, how do you tell when your indigo is ready to harvest? It's big enough. It's really all it is. You have to have at least, you know, four or five knots on the stem so you can cut above two to three knots and let the rest regrow. The, and by that time, the leaves should be big enough and you, you use those leaves. Um, is the same for cold or vat? Is it the same for cold or vat dyeing? I have never done vat dyeing from fresh indigo. I've always just gotten the uh, the powder. So for for the fresh indigo, you'll gather the leaves that way. I don't know how it works. I would imagine you can continue to do that, the, do the same thing to trim it above a couple of knots and let the rest regrow, and then continue to harvest the leaves throughout the season and ferment those through that, what, the long process of creating the powdered indigo for the vat. Let's see, can you explain the process for the way you layer colors? For instance, I think you dye a blank first, then put leaves on it, and then the iron blanket and wrap it up. It totally depends on what I'm going for with each one. Some of them I don't dye at all, I just put the flowers on. Some of them I pre-dye, put some flowers on, put a blanket of color or iron, it completely depends on what I'm going for. Um, and does the mordant from the first dye carry through to the end or do you remordant? Once it's mordanted, it's mordanted. It has the chemical bond that's, you know, of, of whichever mordant you use that's reaching out to hold on to the dyes. So um, if I dyed, if I mordanted something, in, you know, now and then two years from now I wanted to dye with it, it's still mordanted. So you don't have to remordant. Anna Mike Kluiver, <laughs> I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, says, I guess you pre-mordanted your blanks and then add fresh leaves or flowers. Yes. Looking at your videos, you roll them up. Do you wrap them in anything? Sometimes I do. Um, I used to wrap them in aluminum foil to keep it so that one, the colors from one on top don't drip to the next one in the, in the steam bath, but also because I didn't want the the rope that I wrap it with or the string that I wrap it with to make color on the outside. 
So I put something around it. I'm looking at something more sustainable. Right now that I can wrap each one in and reuse, I reuse the aluminum foil two or three times and then it just gets too brittle. So I'm trying to find something else. Um, but I do wrap them up. And how do you steam such big packages? I have two really big pots. <laughs> um, yeah, a very big pot over a very big fire. So I think that's it. I think I answered all the questions. I hope I got to all of them. All right, I think that's it. That is all I know about mordanting and modifying and chemical bonds and all that stuff. I do know that um, Anna of Dunkelgrün, who is a chemist and a natural dyer, has also been planning a podcast on mordanting because she's also been getting questions about how to mordant your fiber. So I would stay tuned for that because hopefully it will be up soon and I know that she will have a lot more information about it. I hope that was helpful and not too boring. It's a really interesting process. It can seem really daunting. If you've been wanting to get into natural dyeing but you're worried that there's just too much to learn, I just start with one plant. You can even start with one that doesn't need a mordant. You can start with a lichen or you can start with you know pomegranate or something. If you want to start with something from your yard, um, you know, find a plant, just use, just start with aluminum sulfate, just that, or, um, or a tannin that you, if you don't want to use the, the metal salts and just expand from there. You know, you can't, you can't jump into it and have all the knowledge. It's always building. There's always more to learn. So just pick one or two things to start with and play around and see what you get. Cause I, I bet you'll have fun with it. Even if you don't get anywhere near the color that you thought you'd get, I bet you'll have fun with it. So that's all for today. I'm heading out in a couple of days to the deep north woods of Maine where I will be completely unreachable by phone or computer or anything for a good week and a half. So if you contact me in that time before the 20th of August, I won't, I won't know. So I won't be able to respond, but I promise to do my best to respond afterwards. And hopefully I will see you guys in a few weeks for another podcast and lots of information about the retreat. Lots of pictures and videos. I hope you guys do well in the next few weeks. See you. Bye.